Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Good morning, Rebecca. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us this morning. I'm thrilled to see you all here. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce Dr. Emily Miller, who is uh, Associate Vice President for Policy for the Association of American Universities. So Emily and I met in October in DC, where she was hosting a conference that was a STEM networking conference. Um, and I was really excited at that meeting to hear about the leadership um, that AAU has been putting forward, and especially under Dr. Miller's work, around teaching excellence. And I know that this room is not full of STEM educators. We are all educators across campus. And I wanna let you know that even though AAU has a particular STEM initiative that Emily's been working on, we're gonna talk more broadly about teaching excellence across campus. Um, but it was just so exciting to, be, to listen to um, the AAU talked to us about how excited they are about our teaching excellence. And here's a quote specifically from our, the AAU president, Mary Sue Coleman. At AAU institutions, we educate close to 1.2 million undergraduate students every academic year. In educating these students, AAU universities have the responsibility to promote the use of evidence-based teaching practices proven by the research to be the most effective at advancing student success. Additionally, they must provide their faculty members with the encouragement, the training, and the support to effectively employ these instructional approaches in the classroom. So I'm excited for that messaging, I'm excited for that leadership, and so I was thrilled that Dr. Miller was willing to come to campus. She'll be doing a number of meetings with different groups all day today and tomorrow. And this morning, she's gonna to talk to us about the importance of aligning practice to policy, which is one of the key components in really recognizing and rewarding excellence on campus and seeing cultural change. So thank you all for being here and welcome Dr. Miller. Thank you. Do we have any undergraduate or graduate students in the audience? Again, be proud that you're here this morning. Um, um, and anyone that would be kind of put in a, a, a different um, category. Okay. That's definitely more than that. But that, that's helpful for me to know just kind of who, who's here, um, faculty members and administrators. Really, thank you so much for coming this morning and starting your day with a conversation. Um, with me. I'm very happy to be here at the University of Oregon. Um, I have not been on your campus before, so this is my first time at the University of Oregon. Um, I've been to Eugene before, but I have not been on campus. So I'll you. So I joined AAU about five years ago in the policy um, um, division. Uh, it's a 27 member organization and I work for um, the Vice President of Policy, Toby Smith. And I was brought on really to focus in on institutional policy, the work that AAU does with its member campuses in the space of undergraduate and graduate education. So I work on projects within the association and our member campuses on the improvement of the quality and effectiveness of both undergraduate and graduate education. My disciplinary background is higher education administration and policy, um, and so I look at this work very much from a lens of institutional and organizational change and a real understanding of faculty work. So that's a, a bit about me. Um, as it pertains to AU, who's, um, why don't you just quickly turn to groups, um, do you know about AAU? If you could put your, like, do you, do you have a sense of who, what AAU does as a national association? Okay. Sometimes when I talk to groups, they're like AAU who or the Amateur Athletic League. I mean, there's a really, there's variance on like who AAU is. So I thought I'd just give a little bit of information about AAU, um, but I can move through it um, quite quickly. So um, AAU is a national association representing 62 leading public and private research universities. Two are Canadian are, and 60 are here um, in the United States. And the portfolio of work um, that we, that the association really works to support across all our members. I could say um, 
uh, falls in three main areas. We have the policy shop that we that I work in that works a lot on institutional policy, cross-cutting issues related to, uh, that affect our institutions. We have I have a group of colleagues that do federal relations work um, that really look to advocate. Um, for issues at the federal level that affect our institutions. And we also work, we have a public affairs um, unit that um, focuses on very much um, um, public affairs, um, press, media, how are we telling the story and the narrative of AAU institutions. Um, and as I said, there's about 27 of us. Um, as a collective, we convene the institutional leadership um, of, our, of, of our member campuses on annual basis and in those conversations, they're very rich conversations amongst the presidents and chancellors or the provosts or your senior research officers around issues that um, our member campuses are wrestling with both in the space um, internally and externally. Um, for who makes up the AAU institutions, just to let you know, um, they, we are, um, the AAU member campuses um, are, are very high engaged in research, um, produce um, a tremendous amount of research nation, nationally, and are recipients of a large amount of federal awards for the advancement of research. There's also a significant economic impact that our institutions have within their state and nationally on, um, on work that, um, that, that emerges from our campuses. Um, and we are very engaged in education, both in the undergraduate and the graduate education space. Um, we produce a significant number of PhD students across the nation. And I wanted to talk about um, the work in undergraduate education. And as Sierra mentioned, about 1.2 million students um, come um, are educated at our institutions every year. And AAU, in 2011, launched an initiative called the AAU Undergraduate STEM Education Initiative. And this initiative um, had some significant motivations on behind why AAU chose to engage in undergraduate STEM education. And I would say it was the starting place. I know that many of you here are in the arts um, and the humanities, and the initiative overall, when we look at it, when we start to look at institutional and cultural change um, and what will sustain efforts on campus, it cuts across all disciplines. But the place that we began was in undergraduate STEM education, and that was largely in part of the policy environment. In 2011, there was the presidential PCAST um, uh, report that was put out around how do we prepare um, a scientifically literate society? How do we think about the scientific workforce going forward? There was also significant research done by the national, done and was culminated together in a National Academies report and a consensus study on evidence based teaching practices that we knew how best to educate undergraduate students in sciences and, and mathematics. And it was thinking about well, how do we scale and spread? and support faculty members in using these evidence-based pedagogical practices. AAU, um, I've, uh, amongst this national context, I wanted to also acknowledge, had been engaged in under, work in undergraduate ed education. We had talked about student success. We had talked about in, in um, a previous report that was done. And in some informal surveys, um, post the Boyer Commission report, when research universities were highly cr criticized for undergraduate education, we asked our campuses, what are you doing? And the large response by campuses is we have undergraduate research opportunities. We know how to educate graduate students, so we're gonna provide that same experience to undergraduate students. So everyone had Europe programs. So we said, beyond Europe programs, what else do you have on your campus? And there were very few things that actually emerged beyond the Europe programs. And things that did present themselves were often outside the classroom. They were in very um, important co-curricular spaces, but it was not necessarily the curriculum of the courses and working directly with the faculty members in the departments. So with this kind of larger context, we um, moved forward with our initiative. Um, over the course of the initiative, we've received 11 grants. Um, we brought in about $8 million in this project to work with our member campuses. And the 
primary overarching objective was to really think about the culture of STEM departments at our institutions and how do we help support faculty to use the evidence-based practices that we know are to be effective. And so with this larger objective, um, we moved in and we had five goals for the initiative. And I'll quickly, I'm going to go through the initiative goals, talk about the work that we've done in those spaces and what we've learned. Um, I, if you have questions as I go along, please raise your hand and ask them. I've also tried to prepare some time for some reflective questions that you can discuss as, at your tables as we move forward. But the first was to develop a framework. Um, if we were to put a framework together for systemic change in undergraduate STEM teaching and learning, what would that look like? How could that maybe drive behavior and conversations on our campuses to think about the improvement of the quality and effectiveness of undergraduate education um, in a holistic manner. We also had funds to seed fund project sites at our member campuses to, almost, to be laboratories, to be pilots uh, to implementing this framework. And we had um, funding for eight project sites, but it became um, very um, evident as this project was unfolding that all the AAU, the intention was for all AAU campuses but it became very evident with the call for the eight concept papers that many AU institutions were wanting to be engaged. And so we quickly wanted to figure out how do we support a broader network across the AU institutions of a community of individuals who um, are dedicated to improving undergraduate education and how do we connect them across our campuses? What convenience and forms could we have and how can we support them? Um, we also felt it was very important to look at a critical institutional policy, and that was around promotion and tenure. How at research intensive institutions, where you are highly valued for your research contributions, will you be um, credited, acknowledged, rewarded, um, supported for your dedication of time and effort in improving undergraduate education? Um, and so we felt that we, um, this was a critical institutional um, policy that, um, that really needs to be thought about of how it is enacted in practice. I don't think any AU campus does not have in policy that teaching is considered as part of the process. But what actually happens in reality, I think, varies greatly by discipline, department, and, and across institutions. So that's the space where we've given some um, dedicated work and partnered um, with some key collaborators nationally. We also wanted to acknowledge that there might be some federal policy levers that we could pull upon um, to help advance this work. And um, the, the area where we've spent energy and time is in the space of broader impacts. Um, broader impacts, um, as many of you are aware, are part of NSF um, grants and it um, is written into federal legislation. And so we wanted to understand how is broader impacts um, supporting undergraduate, the improvement of undergraduate um, education. And so we, I can speak more about the work that we've done in the space of broader impacts. So to just move forward, the framework, um, oh, and the fifth was dissemination. You know. Well, as we move through this process, how are we learning and how are we sharing this both within the AAU community and the broader higher education community? Um, the framework as a document is available online. It has three, um, three layers to it. Really, what is the pedagogical practices, what's happening in the classroom, uh, uh, scaffolding, how are you supporting faculty members and, de and departments um, in the implementation? <coughs> of evidence-based um, practices, and what are the large institutional, cultural um, norms and values that we need to be looking at as we look to having systemic change. I would say this document was sent out to all the AU institution campuses for a comment. It was much, began as a much more prescriptive document, and it got feedback to say that it needed to be more conceptual. Campuses wanted to see themselves um, in this document, and so this document's available and online. Um, for you to look at, but it was kind of the first piece that was kind of guiding the work that we had. We followed up with this report on essential questions and data sources, and this was a development of a document that we felt like, well, how would a campus know that it's doing work across the framework? 
So we have put together a set of questions that could be asked at the department, college, and institutional level to, um, inquire, to, to reflect on to see are you making progress across the elements of the framework. We also found across our campuses that institutional data was being harnessed in very new ways to answer really thoughtful questions around undergraduate education. And so this is a very emergent and developing and growing space. And so we have put together, and it's more robust online, a um, what we are aware of across AAU campuses where there are data sources or analytical tools that are helping to answer those questions and how campuses are using those analytical tools. Some are open sourced. Some are um, some are researched um, research publications um, of different types of um, protocols or, or surveys. But we this um, we found it very important to kind of list what do we know out there on how campuses are actually answering those questions, what in methodologies and instruments and tools are they using, and finally the report puts together um, some recommend addresses some pro some challenges that we recognize campuses have in this space and give some good examples. Some campuses really struggle with IRB. Where's it located? Is educational research for institutional improvement or has it been done for publication? Um, where is data located? What are, um, who has access to data? How can data be used on campuses? Um, how do you address questions around FERPA? So campuses have wrestled with these challenges and they're coming up with some very interesting um, solutions on how they navigate a path forward um, where they've run into some tensions in collecting and analyzing data to answer these questions. So we're trying to keep apprised of what's happening on our campuses in this, in this space. Across um, the AAU institutions, as I said, we had the eight initial seed funded project sites and we had the broader network. But I think a theme that came across in our research when we talked to faculty members and administrators um, on our institution was how, do we, how can we as institutions be as excellent in teaching as we are in research? And um, I, all our campuses have had undergraduate students um, and, and they, I think there has been a commitment to undergraduate students but I think it, it was just resonated like how in the, the value orientations of our institutions um, in, in, in how in our practices um, do we support being excellent in teaching at, as well as in research. Um, and so the eight, these are the eight seed funded campus project sites. We, um, we still are engaged with them, but the data collection for our report went across three academic years. Um, it, these are the total number of departments, the number of transform courses, and the total student seats in transform courses within that three year time. What we're observing in these is many campuses would begin with one section of one introductory course and with evidence that it worked, went to maybe all sections. And then all sections then went to every semester. So it is just, the, the graph is just going up with the number of students touched by um, redesigned um, pedagogy and redesigned courses. And so this is just the numbers um, that were produced across these eight project sites. And each of these eight project sites took on a different approach and strategy that connected to the culture of their institution, different departments were engaged. I think on some campus, some fields you might say they've been leading in this space for a long time. That doesn't necessarily equate that that's the leading discipline within an institution. And so I think each of these campuses had different departments that were really the leads in doing this work, different strategies and different approaches. And we were comfortable as an association that there were going to be different strategies and approaches on how to how, how to advance this work locally within our campuses. Um, we moved quickly to saying, okay, well, we have these eight project sites, and that's wonderful, but half of our member campuses submitted applications, 31 submitted applications. We need to move them forward. So we have, as Sierra mentioned, um, looked to annually convene um, individuals from across our campuses with conferences. We've had focused workshops. We convened department chairs, um, and we will be doing that again. Um, so we've had very targeted convenings for individuals across our campuses. Um, I, I visit campuses regularly along with other colleagues. Um, we try to find other ways to seed fund work on campuses. And um, we recently have 
secured a million dollar grant from Northrop Grumman where we were awarded 12 mini grants to 12 institutions and the second round of that competition will start this fall um, for other institutions. So I put that on your radar for um, coming up in September. But a large number of our institutions are engaged and the engagement doesn't just have with the institutions and us being engaged with the institutions. These are conversations that happen. We bring this work to the presidents and chancellors meeting, to the provost meeting, to the graduate deans meeting. They are having conversations about this work. We are sharing regularly with them what's happening across our campuses in this space. And they are engaging in conversations. And we push them and challenge them to consider, con um, to consider findings that we're learning about. So we published this fall um, a five-year status report. And the report, the executive summary of the report is around on your tables. Um, the full report is available online. Um, the report has um, kind of five section areas. Just quick, it, it, we talk, the first section, what do we do? What, would, what happened over five years across all, all the goals? We have a deep dive into the project sites about um, the, what was learned at the project sites, um, evidence of outcomes that happened at the project sites, and um, we discuss what's happening across the network. And section four really talks about the cross-cutting strategies that we saw happening across our campuses. And I'm gonna spend time talking about those cross-cutting strategies. And the online appendix, um, it's just, if, if you wanted to see any piece of writing or any RFP for the process, what our common data collection efforts were across the evaluation, we've really tried to put an online appendix up. And it's, necess it's more for my colleagues who are running other multi-institutional <laughs> projects. If you wanted to know really how did we go about doing this, all our resources are there. So we wanted to respond to provide to the community what was our approach and strategies and communication that we had across the initiative. So I wanted to discuss um, what we learned. And so this was published in a, um, it's in the report, but we also put out a Change Magazine article this fall, um, is a shorter summary uh, of, of these findings. But um, these are the key elements that I would say that we saw happening across the project sites and the network that really catalyzed a campus to be moving forward in the space of improving the quality and effectiveness of undergraduate STEM education. One was there was a shift explicitly on campuses that the department took collective responsibility for the introductory foundational courses. It was not the course that just got passed from one faculty member to the next with different learning objectives and outcomes. They really thought about what is the curriculum, the learning goals, and the corresponding assessments that go with that course. And regardless of who's teaching it, the commitment to those learning goals and to that assessment. And that was, a, 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 that was some difficult conversations um, within departments. Um, and what is the foundational content for this course? Um, and I think that was a, when we've seen departments engage in those conversations, it's been very fruitful. We've also seen a very um, much, a variety of hiring that's happening within campuses. Um, I don't know your campus well. Do you, uh, some campuses have discipline-based education researchers hired into departments um, within the STEM communities. Others have um, hired um, Dun Morvan, uh, Carl Wyman, SCI model with um, uh, post, uh, postdocs that are embedded expertise in a department to support and work with faculty members. Um, other campuses uh, you know, are working with undergraduate learning assistants or graduate students. But I would say campuses that have really focused to say, how do we bring pedagogical expertise into our department? And how do they not be considered as second tier faculty members? Have really been effective, that they sit on committees. They might not vote for a tenure track faculty member on a research line, but they are part of curriculum discussions. They sit on committees, they partner with faculty, they um, help redesign courses. And, and they are evaluated that a part of their job is for the institutional improvement. So as they work to improve the courses in the course, they're getting that, that you know, that, that is being valued and recognized and assessed for them. Um, and that just, no campus has really designed a new hiring track. They've capitalized on tracks that already exist because they knew going through the faculty senate and new lines or if they were in a system were harder um, barriers to overcome, but they've worked within established um, 
kind of hiring lines to think about how do they bring the pedagogical expertise in the department. And some campuses have made a shift to say, no, we're going to take a research faculty line, and it's going to be a discipline-based education researcher, and their research is going to be an education research, and that's what our department values. So it varies by campus, but that expertise is being brought into, into the departments, and it's very local. It, it's your um, institutional-wide data. Um, it is being elevated to new spaces. I think in a lot of cases, sometimes you would have, it's research and compliance focused. Um, it might have been in institutional research. We see institutional research being moved closer to the provost's office. The office is being talked more about um, institutional research along with student success. How does information get back down to departments to make decisions in a timely fashion? Um, how do you look, um, what type of evidence does your department need or your college need to know that this is working. And so we see institutional-wide data being harnessed in some very um, interesting ways. And there's some campuses really on the forefront of this as well, some national groups coming together on looking at institutional-wide data. Um, but that really does require leadership from the top saying that this is a priority and bringing those, wherever it's housed on your campus, together um, and putting together the supports for that. But we've seen, um, we actually had two campus leads talk to the provosts um, about this and you could see in the room as the provost turned and looked like I don't know if I can answer those questions on my campus I don't have the infrastructure, you know, and we've just seen that emergent of growth um, on a number of campuses um, Teaching and learning is being supported in new ways on campuses and campuses are going through sometimes some hard mergers of different units and bringing them together Sometimes campuses necessarily are starting at a, at a blank slate where they have um, teaching, teaching, how are they going to support teaching and learning um, is, you know, they're, they're able to design a whole new offices. Some campuses have um, very robust teaching and learning centers that are expanding their work and portfolio. And then there are campuses that have been some emergence of STEM ed centers or other areas. I think it's very dependent upon the culture and history of your institution. I, um, some campuses I go on to, the Teaching and Learning Center, is that's where you're sent when you're a bad teacher. It, it is the punitive location to be gone. So it doesn't resonate well with faculty. So new, like new centers are being developed. I, but it, we see um, reorganization on how teaching and learning is being supported. We see how um, undergraduate tutoring is now being brought in with the graduate student training on pedagogy because students are going to the TAs of the courses as well as the tutoring, you know, tutoring center. So how are these supports and infrastructures really being brought together? Um, we've, um, the financial models and the business models that drive things on campuses cannot be avoided and campuses are talking about it. If, uh, are you uh, responsibility center management here? Does, do people know what that is? Not anymore, okay. So sometimes, I mean, un, I think very always well-intentioned designs at one time have unintended consequences down the line. And so in some cases, uh, uh, mathematics really wasn't doing well in teaching the international statistics. So then the College of Natural Science, I'm making this up, the College of Natural Science says, we're gonna teach the statistics internally because we think we can do a better job. Great. Well, then the mathematics department does a whole new curriculum redesign, and they're going to, again, the evidence-based pedagogy. Well, now they're like, well, if we give up the statistics, we're losing a lot of tuition dollars. It's been really good. Here. So it's, it's, the business models drive behavior in very unique ways on campuses. Um, you know, understanding that, I think, is one of the many um, intellectual challenges of my job. When I go to a campus, like, what are the drivers on a campus? And, and the business and financial models are there. Um, you look about how are learning undergraduate learning assistants supported on a campus? Are they supported? Do faculty have more TAs? How, how, how to, um, you know, on some campuses they're like, well, we need funding lines for more TAs to be to do the work in the classroom. Um, learning spaces are being re-engineered and redesigned. Spaces just like this that are often used for talks or alumni events are now that people are saying, well, that's a really good set up here, they're in their round table. So how do you space differently on campus? Sometimes it's been large um, expenditures of resource, resources to redesign spaces, others it's just capitalizing on space that are exists in new ways. And I would say one key thing that we learned is when you, campuses have redesigned learning spaces, who owns the space is critical. 
So often in redesign learning spaces, the provost owns the space and no one goes in that space unless they know how to teach effectively in that space. And that has been a real sense of creating some faculty learning communities that then really want access to the space and then they're learning how to change their courses. But that's, um, and that's engaging the registrar then in conversations around the improvement of undergraduate education. And I can tell you the registrar, I was never in these conversations before, so things are new. Um, Question. Yes. I'm well, I'm sorry about your name, but next to the provost here. Uh, but the provost owns that space. So we'll talk a little more the, right now, often on campuses, the registrar just has every single space of university teaching in, on some campus. And then they'll ask the department chair, we need to know what classes you're teaching. Um, so say it's spring right now. Uh, spring 2019, how many classes? How many seats? And then they're just like plugging like a schedule in and making sure bodies can move. There's not a sense of, well, how's that course being taught? What type of space do they need? So with the redesigned learning spaces, the provost or a, 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 the, is more, it, they're, they are filtering who's teaching in that space. And then they're sometimes prerequisite. Like, well, if you're going to teach in the space, you need to be part of a faculty learning community. All the faculty teaching in the space are part of a faculty learning community. Or we need to see your syllabus of your course that shows that you're going to use the space. It, you, 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 you're not going to be in a very um, redesigned classroom space, but yet still being sage on the stage, you know, from start to finish, you know, um, in, in, in their talks. So does that help answer your question? Um, I think in the, what, what I phrase is the simultaneous pursuit of high quality mm -hmm. teaching and research. Um, how do you support, some faculty members are going to do education research. Some faculty members are going to be embedded expertise in their in departments and working on educational improvements. Other faculty members are running a wet lab bench, but they really want to do well in their undergraduate teaching. And so how do you support them and know that their entire research agenda isn't going to shift? And that's an unrealistic expectation across our campus. So how do you support um, a, a real mixture of faculty who are working in this space? And how do you reward all the contributions of faculty work? Um, and then the real commitment to systemic and long-term STEM reforms. I, I'm sure you see this in the arts and sciences as well. Grant-to-grant -grant funding of efforts to improve the quality and effectiveness of undergraduate education is not a sustainable model. If you've done something or piloted something and it's working, what, what is going to be the business model and the institutional resources that are going to sustain that over a period of time? And so while research is often funded grant-to-grant, Undergraduate education, we really don't think should be looked at in the same way. Um, and then we, as AAU, we want to continue to leverage um, a, you know, how can the institutions benefit from AAU being engaged in this space? How can we leverage AAU to further help things on the campuses? So these are some of the larger um, cross-cutting um, elements that we saw were real factors to campuses moving forward. Some campuses. They were leading in these areas, and other spaces were growing edges, but they've dedicated time to them. And, and I think you, on your campus, there's probably places where you're leading, and there's probably places for growing edges as well. And so I wanted to, you to just make, take a moment right now at your tables and just kind of talk a little quietly, uh, or not quietly, but talk amongst yourselves at, at each table. You know, we, the, those are the factors we observed in our study. You know, are these cultural shifts occurring on your campus? Um, are, how are they being communicated, supported, and measured? Are there other evidences of culture change that you've seen on your own campus? So if you could just turn to your neighbors there and, and have a little reflective time on. Hi. <laughs> Good morning.
We have a, a comments want to come from the table. So, sixty seconds. Um, I've been told that with our live streaming to colleagues in Portland, as well as other parts maybe of the country who might be watching in, that we do need to make sure um, report outs are on the microphone so that everyone can hear. But um, you know, I'm not going to give choice. We're going to go from table to table and <laughs> you know ask for and uh, you know uh, just some thoughts. So, is there a table that is interested or willing to go? First. Okay, why don't we start back here in the back. I'm going to try and be on this side of the room, and hopefully if I can maybe stand beside you or close by the, the microphone can be. Online education. So, yes, thank you. Um, so we talked about two things. We do think there are cultural shifts happening across the university, um, across departmentally in terms of um, grant proposals and development, um, outreach across um, university library systems and departments and in lots of exciting areas. Um, I wanted to ask um, for your perspective. Um, you've been talking about physical spaces and physical resources. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that fits with um, online or digital or virtual kinds of spaces and resources as well? Thank you. Um, what I've noticed on some of the AAU campuses is um, how the online elements that many of our campuses have, and they vary in their infrastructures, but it is allowing faculty members to repurpose how they use in-class time. 
And so I think it has not, um, while some of our campuses have 100% courses online or larger MOOCs or that, that they facilitate, I have um, the MIT report I would really encourage you to look at that was very robustly done looking at MITx. And MITx, um, just to let you know, is a report MITx is the online educational portal for the on-campus MIT students. And they did a lot of cognitive and neuroscience with that report. And it really emphasizes how in the learning process and how students learn, the real benefit of both the online and the in-person. But with the hybrid combination, how in-class time could be repurposed and restructured or rebundled in very different ways um, that were very productive for student learning. Who's next? These guys? Yeah. Uh, hi, Bill Harbaugh, Economics Department. Uh, so uh, we talked a little bit about uh, using data, data to try to improve uh, teaching practices and also the uh, kinds of courses that students are taking so that they can get through uh, in a timely way and learn something. And uh, I think our general conclusion was that the university really suffers from a lack of consistent, high quality uh, access to data and analysis of that data for those purposes. A growth area for many campuses. Um, Dean, I about physics. Um, I, I think what you said at, at the end there, the commitment to systematic um, STEM and other undergraduate education reform versus sort of a grant-to-grant -grant mentality is, is a real challenge for this institution. Um, you know, the research side really emphasizes grant-to-grant -grant and kind of year-by-year -year metrics and things. And, you know, in the past, many of us have had what we consider to be fairly successful STEM undergraduate initiatives that, that have sort of fallen, you know, have, have died off essentially from lack of long-term commitment. Greg yeah. Parsons, political science, and just a, an optimistic note, I mean, so the, these systems <laughs> absolutely are, are essential. Uh, but it, what I'm seeing in political science is, I mean, um, and I think in other departments is, uh, in terms of a cultural shift, uh, Absolutely, they're bubbling up out of the ground. Our younger faculty in particular, right, are totally on board with this mm -hmm. whole conversation. Um, and also, I have the impression that this university at the various levels of leadership also totally on board. Um, and so it really is, that there's, that it's there to be put together, but then it's the systems to make it last. I will be talking about when I move forward to how our AAU is really beginning to, wanting to unearth more. What's the relationship amongst historical activities, current activities, within a campus, um, and how do those be brought, how are those effectively brought together? Um, Sarah Hodges, psychology in the graduate school. Um, one of the things we talked about is there are initiatives, and we've had a number of cultural shifts that we thought we gave a big shout out to the science literacy program. Uh, we talked about the Senate's uh, evaluation of teaching, the, you know, figuring out teaching evaluations. Um, one of the things we talked about is there are resources for starting um, new teaching initiatives and faculty, you know, get a term off or get some extra money to do this, but then they're not, and this, I think that goes what this table said, they're not the, the resources for supporting that. And then the other thing that really was compelling to me and I think to our table, uh, that you said was you can't fund teaching initiatives from grant to grant. Um, that, you know, you maybe want to have seed money to start a program, but then you need to figure out how you're going to support it. Um, in Carnegie New Physiology in the grad school, we had a discussion about um, how teaching was valued at the institution um, from the point of view of tenure promotion and also merit and whether or not, for example, if, um, I don't want to put you your example, but you know, if you had an exceptional research, how bad would your teaching have to be to not get tenure? Um, and so it was just a discussion around these issues about how much not that teaching is not valued, but how it is rewarded. <laughs> Karen Ford, I don't know where I'm from. <laughs> Somewhere at U of O. 
probing facts and there were, um, we, I was here for the part of the conversation where we really think there's a cultural shift going on campus, thanks especially to a few people in this room. And then I, I was interested in um, your point about IR being in the provost office. And I think it's distinctive that undergraduate studies are teaching excellence student success has been moving to the provost office or the provost office has been dedicating a lot of positions and a lot of time and visibility to student success. I'll put it that way. It's not yet we don't have undergraduate studies elsewhere and wonderfully on campus, but our provost, you see it in our provost office. Very nice. And then we didn't get a ch uh, Adrian Lynn, Dean of Libraries. We didn't get a chance to discuss this at the table, but lately been reading about how um, girls and young women are not entering the T part of the STEM as much, um, and wondering how AAU is uh, addressing gender equity and um, people of color entering STEM fields. I, yes. Um, I mean, we've been talking about how do you create, as part of thinking about the improvement of teaching pedagogy, how do you create inclusive and welcoming classroom environments? Just as much as, um, I, I would put it this way, I think we maybe, you know, as we think about how we improve the teaching pedagogy to be evidence-based, also um, how do we look to improve them, the environments being inclusive and welcoming? Um, and I think that fits into the pedagogy. And what, I think it's just as, um, the poor teaching could have moved students out of, of disciplines or areas. I think not having an inclusive and welcoming environment for students in those classroom spaces also can be a factor in students' choices. Um, we, in regards to the overall demographics, that is very um, discipline specific. Um, and I think talking about it monolithically, you get into in not good spaces. It's a very discipline specific. But I think one thing you can say in the aggregate is the students who come to our institutions with the intentions and the aspirations to study certain subjects do not persist. They flow out. And when we look at the analytical data and you look at the student pathways, you can see the students and how they move. And it's interesting with some of the analytics that are put on some campuses, the students are making the choice and the institution has no idea because they're making the choice with their course making behavior, but because they've not officially documented that with the institution, their advising structures are not transitioning or changing at all. We also have um, a large number of in, um, transfer students coming into AU institutions. And there's the real, you know, what counts? And I think sometimes admissions is saying X counts, but then when they get actually in the department, it, it, will, it doesn't add up. And so time to degree of what the student was maybe initially told is shifting on them. Um, so there are, um, uh, and when you look at um, just the demographics of where students are going, um, I think the data has been demystifying in some departments on campuses where they say, oh, we're, we're losing, we're, you know, um, they, they, they're critical of who they're losing. And actually, they are losing some of their best students. And, you know, despite maybe the lore in the department that that's not the case. And so um, I think the data has been a very powerful tool to start a conversation. In of itself, it will not change behavior. Research has shown that. I mean, if we use the data to say that it's going to change our behavior, I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you or having a large national initiative association. But it is a very important foundational place to start the conversation um, um, with the data, I think, in all the spaces that you just spoke about. Juan Carlos Molleda, at the United School of Journalism and Communication. Very nice to meet you. Um, uh, we uh, talk about four things or five things, but um, briefly, uh, the, main, the main aspect is that uh, the fact that we are in this session and having this conversation is part of the cultural shift. The second is that there are some areas like <coughs> chemistry uh, that um, the emphasis has been on research, so how we, they, they can shift uh, from research excellence uh, to also teaching excellence. Uh, the next aspect was computer sciences, uh, how you overcome uh, structural situations and teaching capacity when your major is growing significantly. So your emphasis should be on how to handle this growth. Uh, it would be challenging for them also to introduce a person that is expert in education when you need to cover certain subjects. And in the case of uh, professional schools like journalism and communication, uh, in fact, we are going through a national accreditation um, 
mm -hmm. uh, right now, uh, and the visit is going to be at the beginning of February. And we, um, in, evaluate, in evaluating and assessing uh, teaching, we go beyond teaching evaluations for uh, individual faculty to also evaluate uh, academic portfolios, um, professional portfolio for my students, and also students' uh, performance and student placement, uh, mm -hmm. which is the most difficult part. But to see uh, teaching um, excellence uh, through a, a holistic view, on, on a 360 view, especially focusing on uh, a student performance. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, accreditation has been a lever that some campuses have really used to um, keep it at the forefront um, of discussion. Uh, Ron Ramhol, Associate Vice Provost, and we were preaching to the choir at this table because we're all involved in this, this effort. But I guess I would say that the, I'd first give acknowledgement to some uh, really critical department driven initiatives over the past five to ten years math, chemistry biology, doing some things to really address like high DFW gateway courses and things like that. Um, and I think we're now beginning to elevate the conversation to an institutional level, so that's good. I think mm -hmm. the systemic change is where the, when we'll really see cultural change. I mean, right now we're elevating the conversation. Um, we've got a great teaching engagement program that does great work. Uh, we've got, we formed a teaching academy last year that brings together recognized teachers to both learn from each other and inform teaching excellence. We formed three faculty learning communities last year that are doing critical work around specific questions. Uh, can we keep those things going? That's the big question. Thank you. And I appreciate your um, acknowledgement that the locus is the department. I mean, when you think, when you study faculty, faculty's identities are there to their discipline. And um, that community and locus of the department is really central to where I think you need to have long-lasting and sustained change. And so ignoring the department unit as the real locus it, it is a mistake. But how do you acknowledge the work in that space but make it supported institutionally wide? Yeah, this is uh, Scott Brett from uh, Philosophy and the Provost Office. Um, we talked about two things mainly. Um, the first was the space issue that, that you raised, um, and that we have some pilot programs in place, but we're a ways from being able to kind of implement a pairing of uh, teaching approaches and space, uh, but it seems like a good idea. Uh, we also talked about the importance of um, squaring our budget model and tuition structure with student success, and the fact that we have a long way to go um, without a, a, a credit plateau, um, students are in a position where they're incentivized to register for fewer courses, and the upshot is that it takes them longer, and it makes the process more expensive, and so on. And, and I know we've worked on this some, but that's sort of part of the part of the thinking about student success has to also be thinking about tuition costs and the way it impacts undergraduate students. One thing we didn't talk about was the issue of cultural change, and I just wanted to follow Ron and, and uh, mention the teaching engagement program and the impact it's had over the last couple of years. Um, as the former graduate school dean, one of the things that happened in the last bargaining was that we that the, the union and the administration implemented mandatory training. Part of that mandatory training is actually about teacher education for our teaching GEs. Um, and I think that's part of a general shift paying much more attention to pedagogy. And I think it's being really well supported by TEP and things like the Teaching, the, the teaching Academy and the, the Cates. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Rebar with uh, STEM Corps, STEM Research and Education Center in the College of Arts and Sciences. And uh, our conversation echoed many of the other comments that I've heard here, uh, touching on the relationship between research and teaching and the uh, incentives and structures to support you know, uh, both endeavors. Uh, and uh, we also touched on the changes in the, the business model that uh, has some impact, as you, as you commented earlier. I'm going to pass to one of my uh, colleagues here uh, from business to explain his comment on that. <coughs> yeah, from the, oh, Chuck Kalbach from the College of Business. From the RCM model, there was a, I sat on the curriculum committee for the university as that was being implemented, and we saw a huge number of courses being implemented at departments, so the RCM model drove behaviors that we didn't want. So we really need to think longer term at the unintended consequences 
as we implement some of these things and not just say this is a good thing to do right now, but think longer term in that regard. Just to add on to this thought, thinking about also the how you can merge both the, the research and the teaching uh, into you know, related efforts is, is something I'm, I'm involved in and uh, I think others are thinking about as well. Mm -hmm. Roxy Thorne, College of Design. Um, I think we spoke mostly about the faculty perspective and how do we incentivize and encourage faculty to make changes in their courses, um, to take the time to learn how to learn, how to teach, um, to change their behaviors that they've been doing possibly for decades um, in an environment where I think a lot of faculty feel like they're already being asked to amp up their research agenda, amp up service work. There's been a lot of change in the university over the last few years, which has required a lot of policy development and other things. So I think faculty are feeling a little burnt out and how do we make this attractive to change their pedagogy rather than making it one more thing that they have to do from the top down. Are there any other comments that anyone would like to share? Thank you for taking the time to have conversations with um, um, colleagues you know well or new colleagues this morning and I learned quite a bit about your institution just in hearing your reflections and, 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 and thoughts. So um, thank you. Um, I wanted to speak now to some of the work that AE has done in the more latter um, two goals um, of, the, of, of the initiative and that I think touch upon some of the um, themes that were raised um, in the discussion here. Not all the themes but uh, the two themes. So, we have, as I mentioned when we talked about the goal, talked a lot about how are we thinking about the reward structure um, broadly um, on AAU campuses. And we really set that this should be an expectation for project sites. And so all our campuses that we've seed funded resources to was how are they going to think about the faculty reward structure. Um, and um, that has been an effort that has, we've had to put a lot of um, we had to nudge the campuses quite a bit and not let them kind of not have that conversation. But I would say the AAU's collaboration with the Cottrell Scholars that are funded by um, Research Corporation, RCSA, um, that's based out in Tucson, has been a very productive collaboration. And that emerged um, when Toby Smith, um, Vice President for Policy, was invited out to the Cottrell Scholars uh, meeting. And was in, in that meeting, he shared when AAU was going to be, uh, in 2010, when AAU was thinking about launching this effort. And the Cottrell Scholars are physical scientists who are highly rewarded for their um, research um, discoveries, but a strong interest in undergraduate education. And the scholars there said very quickly, if you do not address the promotion and tenure process, because they were early career faculty, you don't look at promotion and tenure, you can do all this other work in all these other spaces, that you're not going, it's not going to change the behavior at a research intensive institution. And the control scholars also include PUIs, and it's been very fascinating to see PUIs have some of the same pressures on them as well. And the demand for research in those institutions and liberal arts colleges has been growing by the day as well. Even, um, and so we've partnered with the control scholars over a number of years in some research collaboratives. The, um, and we've had a workshop together. And the fascinating part I want to say about that research workshop was we had re research active scientists in the room who didn't know probably, who knew very little about education educational pedagogy, how people learn, how you'd assess teaching. And we had those who had been working in that space and from education for, for years. And it was this aha moment, like, oh, there is literature and scholarship in this space. Yes, there is, okay. And, but then you have the, you know, those who have been in the education space say, well, this is how you do it. And they bring out like these long, you know, um, you know, surveys or like a portfolio based. And the scientists were like, oh no, the, 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 that, is that that is too much of an ask. I don't know how I would fit that into my teaching and my research look. So it was a very productive conversation to say, well, how do you come to a place where something that can be qual a quality uh, of rigor, but they could be functionally used by a large majority of faculty members? And so we moved from that workshop report, we wrote an article in Nature. And I'm, my, as I said, my discipline was higher education. 
did I ever think I would write an article for Nature. Never. <laughs> but the scientist said, if the scientists are going to change, we need to publish this in the place the scientists read. So we got an article in Nature about the work we were doing. And then we moved to a workshop that moved to really about practices as to policies. And AAU surveyed um, kind of a small sample of our institutions about their policies, institutional policies. All of them had something in it about teaching. But it's the enactment of those policies where we fall short, where we, our actions do not live up to the espoused values that we articulate. And that needs to be thought about how do we think about that in the hiring, the expectations that are set from the start, what type of tools and resources are we giving to faculty to be able to document both their contributions to research and to teaching, how is it viewed in committees, and when you get to the institutional level, um, I think this will be a good example, who's there kind of articulating that in one discipline, two peer-reviewed pieces, um, you know, we, we, I'm mixing, in teaching people say it's very, it, it, it's hard, it's hard, like how do you, how do you document it, how do you differentiate between it? We've seemed to figure out how to do that with research, knowing that research productivity looks very different in different fields. And so we've been able to figure out that like being a co-author with 10 others from your lab in one discipline and having many publications is just as robust as maybe someone who published a book in, a, in, in another discipline. And so how, we're making sense of some real differences in disciplines of research. How do we start to become more comfortable with maybe the ways in which teaching is documented a, a, across the campus? But we're talking about, well, how do you think about that? What I would say is campuses are experimenting. Um, University of Kansas has a rubric right now that they're using to, um, and they're piloting within departments. And their strategy is just as you come up with an aggregated number on those student teaching evaluations, we need a, we need a number. And now and we want it to be a thoughtful number and how it comes together. But in the eyes of the, they think like how do we come up with something that looks similar, feels similar, but documents. So they're piloting a rubric based approach. <laughs> um, University of California, the policy says two forms of evidence. The online form, there's only a box for one and it's for student evaluations. So no one ever put the second piece of evidence. So their, uh, their practice change was the online system form needs the second box. Oh, that caused a stir. What do I put in the second box? Like, I don't know what to put in the second box. And so then it's been an educational process, particularly at the University of Irvine campus, like what could possibly go in that second box to document um, effective teaching? Um, UMass Amherst is doing some work. Colorado is looking at something in their Senate. Um, I mentioned these because in a CBE life science essay article that was just published this fall, we talked about aligning um, policies to practices, but we highlight three institutional examples um, in there of what they're piloting. So you could look at that. In addition, they just received an NSF IUS grant where it's going to be studied about these implementations and learn from them. So I think there's a lot of emergent work happening in this space. Um, and that research group that's doing the study is part of the Bayview Alliance. Um, there's also a national group called Accelerated Systemic Change Network, and it has working groups. And one of the working groups is on thinking about faculty work and how do we think about rewarding and acknowledging all aspects of faculty work, but we're starting, the starting places they're going to look at teaching. I'm co-chairing that with um, a faculty member at Laverne University, and that um, working group is cutting across all all in all higher education sectors. And so um, I'm very much trying to represent the research universities in that space. And lastly, AAU thought about um, and has put together a prospectus. Um, we've worked with our CSA on um, defining this more, um, working to raise the money to launch this. Um, but a department award. How could you recognize a department for quality and effective undergraduate teaching? And we're thinking about, it wouldn't be an AAU award. I think we're just, we're, it, it would be a STEM department award managed out of RCSA. We are working just to define it though. It'd be for the, probably the very high Carnegie classifications. But if you could, I think if I were to ask you right now across your discipline, could you tell me 
the leading departments in research in your field. You could probably name some institutions for me where the departments are really leading. Can you do that for education? And so how can we think about it in that way? So we're really working this space in multiple areas, um, but it, it, it's, a, it's a space where there's experimentation, learning, but it's a place where we're kind of continuously to put pressure forward. Um, broader impacts, I'm going to speak to this. Um, Toby Smith, um, who uh, does work at AAU very much in the space of um, federal relations, has been very active in the space. There's a national alliance of broader impacts. And I just wanted to speak to you a bit about broader impacts. Um, NSF proposals are required, as you know, intellectual merit and broader impacts. Um, and broader impacts can result from a number, many things can meet broader impacts, but many faculty members don't know that improving undergraduate education in your courses at your university counts as a means to meet broader impacts. We did have some informal surveying um, with NSF about broad, on broader impacts, and the reality is, is if you exclude like career wars and other things, it is very, it, faculty members don't use it. They do not use it. I think there's fear that it, it's the easy way to have, if your research is maybe on the line, if you have your broader impacts on improving undergraduate teaching, it will sink your proposal. So there's real fear in, in this space on faculty. Um, we're working with NSF and the program officers to like how do we have more thoughtful conversations in this space. But something that was done um, between the 2010 when the broader impact criterion was put in the America, the competes legislation was that um, we, um, so it was moving education. What we did in the most recent legislation, the ACIA, which, Betsy, can you help me with the, the acronym of the AC? The American Competitive and Innovation Act, I think is what it was. We lobbied and worked hard to have the word and instruction added in. So it said improve undergraduate education was what the initial legislative language said, but we've made it improve undergraduate education and instruction and wrote bill justification language that supports why we wanted to add the words and instruction. And so with that in law, and I know that sounds very high here, then we can start working with the program officers and the panels so that maybe we can get to a place where broader impacts um, when faculty members are talking about the improvement to their own courses on their campuses, that, that it's used more readily um, and it does allow research funding to be committed towards this space. So we've been, we worked hard with the um, legislative language um, last year and now we're kind of moving into the space of education around this new legislative language. Um, AAU um, has, uh, is advancing further research agendas in two areas that um, I wanted to just bring your, to your attention um, that are, go beyond the five goals of the initiative, but uh, I think were important research projects that we wanted to advance. The first one is in partnership with Adriana Kizar, and it was asking about what's the role of a national association, and that's more for AAU internally to know what leverages, what levers do we have? Where is our strength as an association in working with our member campuses to improve undergraduate education, and what can we say to our other peer associations or multiple or our other national projects? And so we've learned quite a bit of, about ourselves in this in this process, and that will be coming out in a report um, in the next month. And it, it, as we've learned, um, it's helping us to design um, our our efforts going forward. And the other study that is with um, Jim Fairweather and Mary Dean Sorsonelli um, is understanding the relationship amongst multiple efforts on campus. So as I went to campuses initially as part of the project site, we would talk about their engagement within the AAU STEM initiative. But then I'd hear, oh, there's an HHI funded project and we have something over here in DUE and we've gotten an, uh, institutional dollars to do this. And it, I started to ask the question, what's the relationship amongst these activities within a campus? And that's when I started to learn that maybe there wasn't as much of a relationship or alignment as we would hope for. And so we are studying for eight of our campuses that have a high volume of activity going on where they have, where we see some real promise in how they are aligning 
or in organizing these efforts. And we're, we have completed our first round of case study data collection this past fall, and we'll be going back for a second round next year. But we hope that this could be beneficial to our campuses, knowing that all our campuses have many activities going on, but just to really understand what would be um, principles of practice that really help align and coordinate efforts within a campus um, and not have them operating in, in silos. And so we're, we're excited about um, this project and, in, and it's in a real recognition of the multiple efforts happening within any one individual campus that's on, um, that are AAU members. So I um, just want to say, you might want to mark your calendar that um, the second round of mini grant proposals are going to be due in September. Those are inst those are funds that go to an institution. So um, your campus will be a call will be sent out if your campus wants to submit something, and um, in an effort to support the network but also support the departments, we're going to alternate the larger, broader network conference that you'd all be invited to. Um, on alternating years with targeting STEM department chairs. And so the department chairs are, uh, workshop is going to be held this October in 2018 and we'll be looking to have provosts send teams of department chairs um, to a convening that we're hosting and really allowing department chairs within AAU institutions to have conversations within their discipline and across their discipline and we found that to be very productive. Um, so with that, I, I, we have an advisory board. I just want to acknowledge that they've been um, really thoughtful leaders from the STEM disciplines and education that have guided the initiative um, all along and um, they ha have um, continued to provide guidance and pushed us in good directions. Um, so I want to acknowledge their continued support over the years. Um, but I thank you for your time. I know that your campus at this point like moves to like um, next shifts, but I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. In the undergraduate space, we are we have been staying um, focused in the STEM space. But as we look at the institutional rewards, that cuts across all disciplines. So as we move to that, I also have, um, as I said in the, my introductory remarks, um, I'm responsible for graduate education. And so AAU will, is in the process of standing up an effort in PhD education, and that will cut across all disciplines and so we're looking um, in the space of graduate education we will be doing work across all disciplines um, where we go in undergraduate education to the broader disciplines um, I think will come in time I think the challenge some challenge that I faced in that space is the evidence base that was really developed in the sciences um, is not as coordinated and as strong in, in, in the arts and the humanities. But I do think when you think about what we're learning in the STEM disciplines, I think that there are ways that that can carry over in the arts and humanities. And there's things in the arts and humanities that can be brought into the STEM disciplines. Um, one thing to also acknowledge is I think with AAU's initiative in STEM, we focus in on large introductory courses. I imagine the first place we'd go outside of STEM would be in the social and behavioral sciences, looking at the economics courses um, and, and maybe some of the introductory psychology where they're just really high, large enrollment courses on campuses. bringing together the different people in this room. Our opportunity is how do we um, add up all the pockets of initiatives and experiments that are going on right now on campus? How do we discover what they are and actually build some connective tissue institutionally? <coughs> Tonight, at the Holt Center, we have a performance of Tesla which is a world premiere, which is the harmonics laboratory by four faculty here in physics and digital anim animation and choreography and music. And they are addressing on stage scientific experiments and arts and music. Mm -hmm. And how do things like this get translated into our curriculum and pedagogy? We are doing this across campus in all these conversations. And here we have this opportunity to begin to add it up for the resources that are here. Mm -hmm. So I'm very grateful for this. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Oh, thank you. I, I think that I'm gl glad to hear about that work happening here, and it is about how, you know, who builds the bridges within your campuses and the relationships and the connections and, you know, the, the, the full-time job, if not more, amongst many people. <clears throat> Any other? Many of you I think I might see in subsequent meetings over the next um, two days, so I look forward to um, meeting with you if I have the chance um, in a more one-on-one -on -one conversation or a small group conversation. Also know that um, I'm available at any time at AAU. I speak to individuals on our campuses at all times, so um, if you'd like to call or arrange um, a Skype conversation, um, I'll happily accept your uh, request and invitation. So please feel free to contact me um, at, at AAU if you'd like to speak more. Thank you. Stay tuned for more conversation. Um, Noah Fickelstein, the, the center of the top of the list, thanks to an AU travel grant, he will be coming to visit us as well um, on February 5th, so in barely a month from now. So stay tuned to hear more about that visit as well. And thank you so much again. Okay.